Today we have Emma Boster with us uh, from Dying Wish. And uh, yeah, I mean, th this feels like kind of a dream come true interview for Colin and I, at least for me, for sure, because uh, Dying Wish has been one of those bands I've been listening to now uh, for a few years. I mean, you guys are fairly new and it's not like you guys have been around for like 20 plus years here, but uh, hopefully uh, at some point you will be. But uh, so but with that said, like there are a lot of kind of these newer heavy bands that have been in my the world of listening uh, over the last few years, and Dying Wish is certainly one of those. Uh, I remember Damn. watching you guys a couple years ago now at uh, Furnace Fest, which was just an absolute killer show, uh, and it was so much fun just watching you run around, do your thing, uh, and uh, yeah, I, it's just it's so much fun to just like see Dying Wish just become bigger and bigger every year, uh, and it's one of those, uh, you, you guys are one of those bands where I just feel like everybody should know about you so i'm finally glad that we're able to do this so anyway with all that said i know you're busy on tour but uh how are uh, how are things going emma besides the fact that it looks like you have like a broken wrist or something <laughs> um well yeah this is um kind of old i guess I, I severed my tendons and had to get surgery about seven weeks ago oh my goodness um so i'm still healing but i'm just really sore today so i needed a little bit of extra support i've, I've been kind of we, we do merch ourselves. So, um, I, I like set up merch every day and do all the counts and stuff. And I just think like the past few days, I've just kind of strained myself, maybe working a little too hard, but besides that, um, yeah, everything's going great. We've, um, today we're actually in Houston. It's the last, um, show of our tour, which is like the first leg of our headliner that we're doing with Excide Gates to Hell and Emerita. Um, and we're at White Oak today. It's cool because Omerita's from Houston, actually. So it'll be a hometown Ooh. show for them. Um, and then we have to say goodbye to them. We drive down to Miami and we do the uh, Headbangers Boat with Lamb of God, nice. War, Hate Breed, Mastodon. It's like a crazy lineup. So um, we do that. And then sometime next week, we I think it's like Saturday or Friday or Saturday, we start our tour in Tampa with Roman Candle, Foreign Hands, and Boundaries. So uh, then we have like four weeks of a uh, full US tour um, with them, which will be awesome. And then the record comes out on November 3rd as well. So uh, a, lot, a lot going on in the Dying Wish camp right now. <laughs> yeah, can, we, can we can we talk about how you guys are basically like masochists for, uh, <laughs> for travel and just insane touring schedules. I mean, I, I swear every single time I see you guys, uh, or, or when I look, when I check your tour schedule, I'm just like, how are you making it to these, to these gigs? <laughs> like, right. I um, mean, it, it just looks like, it looks like hell. Yeah. Well, we sleep in the van. I kind of showed you earlier. Um, so like, we don't, we're not really a hotel van. We'll do it for like off days or something, but, um, we just leave the venue every night after the show's over and drive to a uh, planet fitness in the next city and then just sleep in the van. Um, <laughs> so do you guys work you know, out too? Is that, is that like the, the reason you, know, the deal? you choose planet fitness or some of us do? Yeah. And they, it's just shower, you know, like a free shower. Sure. Um, especially on this tour. Like I guess I've never thought about that. Yeah. Planet fitness. Like if you got a, and it's a super cheap membership. So yeah, you pretty much uh, can go across the nation and get a free shower. Yeah, and they're everywhere, and it's only ten dollars a month. So, so shout sense. out Planet Fitness. I don't know. Give me like a year free because I talk about them so much. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> we. But you know, last year we did five full U.S. tours. We did one tour in Europe, also on top of that, and we did two pre-production uh, sessions in studio with Randy for to prepare for the upcoming record. So last year was really busy. Um, this year we just wrote the record. We did um, Europe with counterparts, and then we've just spent all summer just kind of preparing for, you know, our headliner and stuff. We wanted to not, like, tour too much so that people, you know, we didn't, like, want to burn out our fans, I guess, on having to come see us multiple times this year um, so that they could come see our headliner. So we took it easier, but next year for this uh, album cycle, I'm sure we're going to hit it pretty hard. It, it's almost like you guys uh, – it's almost like – because you guys – kind of started and kind of started getting like your, your, your big stuff, your big, uh, wings, I guess we could say during, uh, during COVID. So mm -hmm. maybe you're just like making up for lost time. Is that what you're, is that the, the thought process here? Um, kind of, <laughs> I mean, we, we had never done anything except for like a week at a time before 
COVID happened and then um, we got signed and wrote a record and then, you know, kind of just got to wait until the perfect timing to put it out. So um, it does kind of feel like, you know, we are making up for a little bit of lost time, but we really just hit the ground running after the pandemic, like allowed us yeah. to kind of start touring again. And we've, I mean, it's a completely different situation as to like, we were like a DIY local band before that, you know, playing Portland shows and whatnot. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty different. For sure. L well, let's kind of talk about some of those early years for you all. Uh, and I, I, I don't know the like the rest of the band well enough to know if like everybody's original at this point still or if there's been some band member changes or not but can you talk about some of those early years like what even got you wanting to start playing metal music screaming singing uh what what got you to this point where you eventually even started dying wish so even before dying wish like what got you wanting to do this kind of music and kind of gave you that uh catalyst for or uh you know started that fire for you to be like i want to do this yeah, for sure. Um, well, I don't really know. Like, it, it kind of happened, like, really organically and, like, naturally. My mom, my mom is uh, 49, so she's very young. Um, she grew up in, like, the Northwest, like, grunge alt-rock scene. Um, and then had me when she was, like, still a teenager, basically. So I grew up listening to, like, Nirvana and No Doubt and... Um, later found out she like likes Fugazi and like Dead Kennedys and stuff so like you had, that. So you had like, a, the cool mom is what you had oh, yeah. in the Frank Damn, yeah. <laughs> For sure. Gretchen, yeah, Gretchen my, is my dope. Mom grew up. I, I grew up with CCM with my mom. So uh, your, your mom is way better <laughs> or way cooler oh. than my mom. <laughs> I'm sure your mom rocks too. But um, my mom, yeah, she's kind of she always like? been pretty hip. Um, nice. Go Gretchen. So I had like that foundation of like rock music. And then as I like got into middle school, MySpace became a thing. And I lived in a really small town in Southern Oregon at the time. So I didn't really like have access to subculture outside of, you know, uh, like a online platform where I talked to strangers, which is like kind of weird for 14 year olds to be doing, but you know, we all did it then. Yeah. And um, that's how I discovered like the bring me the horizons, a day to remember. Um, and then I also had a, like a friend at school who was like a skater he burned me um, a mix CD with a bunch of like different Metallica and like Black Sabbath and like Children of Bodom, like super random stuff. And so kind of happened like that. And then I moved to Portland, which is about five hours north of where I'm from when I was 14. And then I met Pedro and Jeff, who actually are in Dying Wish, um, original members. And uh, we just started going to shows together. Um, like all throughout like our youth until you know we were in our mid-20s and then just decided one day like let's start a band so um kind of kind of a you know crazy little story but it was just like once i went to my first like show it was all over from there <laughs> dang what was it about the show itself where you're like that that is that's what i want to do i like that that's got to be such a cool experience for somebody to like watch somebody you know, like to watch specifically like heavy music, hardcore metal, all of that kind of stuff. And just to see that show for the first time and be like, oh, my God, like that, that is what feels like I'm what I'm supposed to do in the world. There must have been something like that for that first show, right? Um, I don't really know if it was ever like that's what I'm supposed to do, because like, to be fair, I didn't really see a lot of people that looked like me doing it. So mm. I didn't really think it was possible, you know, Um it was a lot of men and, you know, women had our place at the time in the scene. I mean, granted, this was like 15 years ago now. Um, but I guess it was just like I moved a lot as a kid, moved schools and stuff. And I like I was never like popular. You know, I was kind of always the weird kid. And once I found a subculture where I felt like I fit in and I belong somewhere like that, that was the moment where I was like, OK, like mm. finally, like this is this is for me. Mm. Did you, uh, what was that point where you did feel like, oh, th like I want to do this and uh, like I want to do this at least to a certain extent, you, having no idea whether or not you'd be able to make a living, I'm sure. But mm -hmm. like there, there had to have been some commitment at some point where you're like, I'm just going to go like full in. I'm a, I want to record music. I want to tour. I want to play shows. Like I want to do the whole thing. 
at some point you must have made that decision. Uh, what, was there any, what's the context around whenever that decision was made for yourself? Well, so I, I always wanted to be involved. Like that's, that's really where it started. Um, I, I just wanted to like, you know, I'd always gone to shows, but I wanted to be more involved in the community. And so I started booking shows um, almost 10 years ago now. And oh, that's crazy. It, it was probably 2015, <laughs> 2016. Um, but I, there was kind of a lull in the hardcore scene at the time. And so I was like, well, like, I'll just I'll just start booking shows. And then, you know, um, there was like a group of women that were there was like a feminist movement happening in, in my scene at the time. And so um, I was like, yeah, I can do this. And so I started booking shows. And then I realized that there weren't a lot of local bands to put on shows. So I was like, well, we should start a band because then I'll have more bands to book on shows. <laughs> when, you At know. least one more. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so. And then, you know, it was like, oh, well, you know, I want to play with Vane when they come through and um, see Space Cowboy and like all of these bands that I liked. Um, so I started a band with my friends and then we um, started playing shows and like making all these connections with cool bands that within the scene that we really liked and made friends. And then we just like started making better music. And then it just kind of all like naturally happened. And then. I think the the moment where I realized like, oh, like this is a real thing. Cause I was already working in the industry as a production manager and a talent buyer for a mm. like club venue in Portland. Um, so I was already in the industry and I knew that I wanted to do something in the industry, but I just didn't know exactly what. And then like, once we met Tom, our manager, he was like, oh, I could get you guys signed. Like, do you want to be a full-time band? And I was like, I mean, yeah, like that seems like, you know, the coolest avenue I've always wanted to like perform. So um, I I'd say that was like pretty late 2019 is when I kind of came to that realization. Wow. Uh, you know, this is something that I'm, I'm not super aware of. You said there was a, a little bit of like a feminist movement going on uh, around the time that you started to gain interest in this. Uh, can you kind of talk us through that a little bit? I, I'm, I'm curious. We're, we're both, Mason and I are from South Dakota, so we are as far away from anything that's cool and hip and happening. So, um, yeah, if you if you would kind of like yeah. walk us through that, like, like, like what did that look like for you? Um, well, I've been going to shows. Like, I went to my first hardcore show in like 2000, oh, 2010, 2011. Um, and at the time, it was a lot of dudes. There was like a lot of, you know, masculine energy um not a sure. lot of women all of the women were made to feel like we were in competition with one another for the most part mm. and so it was just kind of a toxic environment for women and um i just kind of persevered because i loved the music so much but um around 2015 there was like a series of people in the scene that were coming out um about like with allegations i guess you would say about other people within the scene sure and so like we all like all of the women kind of like united with each other and we were like we are not gonna like continue to tolerate this if we want to be a part of heavy music and so we actually started this movement called no to rape culture and it was like kind of like an activism group but like anyone was welcome to join we like held meetings that anyone could come to and like we did workshops at shows and we like would give wow. away zines at shows and teach people about consent and, um, you know, just try to like educate people um, about consent in order to try to avoid like more like sexual assault things happening within the scene. Um, it was kind of short lived, but that happened around like the era in which, you know, I started booking shows. And so um, ever since then, I feel like we've seen such a culture shift just generally and heavy music about, you know, with like more women playing in bands and, you know, more women being employed by bands and, um, you know, just working in venues. And I, I just feel like we've seen a, a pretty big culture shift. It kind of just all happened at the same time. Not saying that we were responsible for that, but we were definitely inspired by other things we'd seen going on at the time. Well, I'm sure that you played some sort of a, some, some sort of a role there um, because I, that, that's like one of the biggest reasons that I kind of turned away from metalcore and hardcore for a long time, yeah, especially around year 2012. It, it just seemed like it just seemed like it kept getting more and more ridiculous and like sexualized uh, in terms of like, as you're saying, like non-consent type stuff. And also just like violence towards women was like, it was 
pervasive in the lyrics and everything. I was just like, this is gross. I don't like this. Um, yeah. I'm not, not only am I not going to choose to, or not only am I going to choose not to listen to those bands, but I'm going to pretty much just take a step away until this feels healthier because mm -hmm. it was not healthy for a long time there. So good on you. Good on you for, for, uh, for standing up for a, a scene that, that needs some femininity. Well, yeah, thank you. I mean, I wouldn't have, I, I definitely wouldn't have, wouldn't have been able to do it by myself. That's for sure. So yeah. Um, I'm always like thankful for the other women and like, you know, also like the queer people in the scene who have also been marginalized in this community. And, um, you know, I just think that all around we're starting to see a lot more diversity um, in heavy music generally, and it's only going to get better. So it's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it, it does feel like there is like kind of this like cultural change. And, you know, I, I would say like punk and, and a lot of these alternative scenes, there always has been like some sort of like counterculture, like culture to that mm -hmm. world. But there obviously there are many, many cases where eventually it gets overrun by a lot of patriarchy going on, a lot of homophobia, transphobia, all the things that happen, obviously, in the world uh, and eventually gets overrun by a lot of that. Uh, but at the very end or you know at the very end of the day i think in a lot of these cases a lot of like a lot of the this great like a lot of this great music at the end of the day to me is like it started with uh it, it started with people of color it started with women it started with queer people and and that like to me is such an important part of our history and so to bring that back to revitalize that i think is so so crucial not only for obviously what is important but also to like honor like the people the the you know the punk and hardcore and metal people that came well before us uh and so i, th I think it's just a really re important part of the movement for for many reasons including uh you know just honoring honoring those who came before us um let's talk about kind of those uh kind of middle years obviously you've released uh, like a few uh albums at this point or a couple albums at this point uh with dying wish uh <laughs> what at what point did you realize like not, not only like did you want to kind of do this uh like kind of get committed but like at one point uh, there must have been a certain point where you're like wait, like I actually can kind of like pay some of the bills doing this. Like this, this is actually putting food on the table. This is, you know, this I don't know. I don't know if Emma agrees. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you aren't quite there yet. I don't know. Who knows? But like, it does yeah. seem as if like you guys are growing to a certain level where it, it, it you know, it's, it's much more uh, sustainable than probably it was when you first started, I would imagine. But uh, yeah, I, I would imagine at some point there has been some level of like, th this isn't just like a hobby. This isn't just like a side thing. Like this does this feels like a main thing that you're doing. At what point did you feel like you kind of got to that point uh, where you didn't have to keep telling people like, yeah, this is just like the thing I'm doing right now or whatever, like where people are just sort of expect like, Emma, this is what you do. Yeah. Well, this is my job. It's not yeah. very like, you know, we, we don't, we don't lose money. That's for sure. Um, that, most that of the time important. anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, I would say probably last year, Last year, before we left for uh, the Devil Wears Prada, we we went on the zombie tour. I quit. I quit my job that I worked at um, be, because I was, you know, touring so much. I was working at a venue, and ironically, they were like, "We don't really want to work with your schedule," which is interesting because it's a music <laughs> venue. But um, so I hadn't worked there since 2021, okay. and uh, I I got a. Um, a job working at a at a restaurant a vegan restaurant like 25 30 hours a week just to kind of like make some money on the side and um i quit in <clears throat> like july of last year and i i mean i I've, I've gone back like for like a week or two here and there a couple times but besides that i was like wow like you know music is my job now that's crazy um and it still kind of feels that way, you know, but I just like, I work so, we all work so much for this that it's like, I don't have time and energy to invest into anything else at the moment. Like I book shows still occasionally, but um, besides that, it's like, nope, this is it, you know? And so um, it, it gives you a different kind of ownership over the music and, you know, you definitely invest differently once, you, you know, it's your full-time thing. Yeah. 
do you feel like that's that's uh that that's paid off in terms of like your um like the, the edification of it i guess or, or uh, i don't know how that that's probably not like a great way to put it but do you feel like do you feel like you're like more creative now and like because it is the thing that you're doing solely that yeah. you that you can put all your energy into it yeah definitely um i'm i'm just like i'm constantly thinking about the future of this band i mean i i, I always was but like you know now more so there there were times when i started this band i was you know working at three different jobs and still being in the band and booking shows on top of that so like i couldn't i couldn't do that and like you know be like the creative person that i am you know like i i need like the the freedom and the time off to like put myself in that headspace outside of you know working on tour yeah for sure wow I was, yeah, I was about to ask like a very similar question where, you know, I've like, I've thought about like, you know, I, I do all these other kind of things in the world besides like my main gig. And I've wondered like how my relationship would change to all these like different projects that I work on if those became like the way that I made money. And I, I've always <laughs> wondered that for artists uh, as well, where, where they get to that point where that is the way that they you know, pay the bills. That's the way that they put food on the table and, and how that changes their relationship to their art. Um, yeah, that, it, I, I would imagine I, it's probably a similar question to what Colin asked, but yeah, like if, I, I don't know if you have any like additional thoughts around that of like, if, if there has been a relationship change to your art based on the fact that now you're full-time. I would just say that I'm more confident in mm. it just generally, but I'm sure that has something to do with it. Yeah. I would say that this that this new EP and subsequent record that we haven't heard yet, um, it shows that like this is this is a huge step up. I mean, the last records are great. This uh, the new songs are fucking breathtaking though. Like mm -hmm. I especially my promise will die. Uh, that that song is like my I, I can't stop listening to it. I, I've mm -hmm. played it probably 20 times a day for the last three weeks it's incredible awesome. yeah i love that that's song like, that's um, like what five cents that you just gave them cullen yeah yeah <laughs> congrats but yeah thank you yeah You're that's welcome. actually how i pay my bills yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh just kidding it's t-shirts but yeah <laughs> so how's this new record been uh I, I mean it's coming out november 3rd right yeah, Friday. So, I mean, it's Saturday. So, yeah, November 3rd. I'm sure this will air later. But, um, yeah, so we've been playing Lost in the Fall, Torn from Your Silhouette, Watch My Promise Die, and Path to Your Grave, all four singles on this headliner that we're doing right now. But wow. um, when the record comes out, we're going to play, honestly, like probably seven or eight songs off of the record. I think it's wow. seven or eight. So, um, yeah, there's there's a a song that is actually like a ballad on the record Ooh. um so Ooh. that'll be like kind of you know a moment in our set we're not playing it right now but you know where it kind of like you know bring it down a notch like hey everybody take your phone lights out like shit that we've never done before so yeah um it's exciting to be able to try new stuff and like keep branching out like keep expanding on on what we do already does that mean, uh, is, is that song going to be fully sung instead of screamed? Uh, there's about two lines that are screamed in the entire song. Nice. Okay. I, yeah. I, I, I love, I love that, uh, that juxtaposition of like really beautiful singing along with the intensity of a scream. I mean, it's just, it, it, it'll never get old to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Same. I, I love it too. It's really fun. Um, We've been playing Lost in the Fall. That's my favorite song to play, you know, because the end, like the hook has like, you know, the piano and then like the really like kind of quiet, it's like more yeah. of like a falsetto singing. And then it right into like the big chorus after like a really, you know, it's like heavy breakdown, like the most light thing you could possibly imagine in the set. And then like a big boomy chorus. It's, it's, it's a fun dynamic to play. Yeah, I can imagine. You guys obviously are, you know, the, for the for the new stuff, like there there are obviously some songs that are a little bit different for you all, but for the most part, like th this is stuff like you would expect from Dying Wish, where like there's these really brutal breakdowns. 
your your screamings uh, your screaming is just as good as ever your vocals are great uh and, and you're you, you should expect that from dying wish but is there anything besides a ballad uh that you would say fans like hey like you haven't heard this from us before like is there anything kind of new or like some sort of different sounds or anything like that that are or just feel or maybe songwriting even that just the way the songs are structured is there anything new that fans would be like a little bit like whoa we haven't heard that before yeah the opening track which is the title track symptoms of survival um that song it has it starts like with like a really cool like drum intro and then like this it has like i don't know how to explain it there's parts of it that sound kind of doomy which is Ooh, something that we've never okay. done before and um there's like a really long instrumental break towards the end of the song that has like a bunch of like clip like talking clips over it from like theodore roosevelt and like the song the song's written wow. about like the sacrifice of war and um which you know is it, we, I wrote the song in, in March and didn't, you know, think that it would be as pertinent coming out yeah. right now. Yeah, but shit, no shit. Yeah, um, so that's interesting. But um, Unfortunately, the most pertinent thing in, uh, in, in the world today forever and yeah. always has been, always will be, is probably war. So, yeah, I mean, very well put, though. Yeah, so, I mean, it just, like, it, it just talks about, you know, things that we haven't really talked about, more of, like, I, I wrote in a less like anecdotal personal like lens and more just like objectively about war, which was definitely kind of me stepping out of my shoes and trying to stretch my um, like creative writing ability. So um, I think that and the ballad are going to be like the two big moments on, on the record that people are going to be like, whoa. Hell yeah. I'm all for that. You guys like have never you you sort of like balance between this uh, talking about things politically in your lyrics, but also being able to talk about things that are just like happening in your lives and just the kind of the overall human experience. And there's this balance that goes on with that. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about how it may be at some point like it doesn't feel like you're trying to balance between like it's like two different things that you're trying to balance uh, between. But uh, I'm I'm curious around that of. you, and I, I've heard this from other bands around like, you know, there, there's a political aspect that I want to talk about, but there's also this other thing that they want to talk about. And uh, at, at some point it, it does feel like th- they're trying to sort of juxtapose those and they have to balance between them. But also it does feel like Dying Wish doesn't have to do that so much. But anyway, I'm curious around like how you navigate that relationship, I guess is probably a better way uh, to put it. Like how you navigate that relationship between the things that you want to talk about politically, but also uh, the, the things that sort of feel like a general human experience beyond the politics. I guess it is just general balance, but I, I wouldn't say that I stress so much like, you know, because something that this record and fragments have in common is, you know, talking about personal trauma and then talking about you know, the collective trauma that our society deals with. And, um, you know, I might run out of things to say, but I highly doubt it. That's like one of my main like things that I worry about is like, am I ever going to run out of things to talk about? So I try to just like balance it and generalize it a little bit so that, you know, it's, it's relatable, but so I also don't like burn out a certain topic, you know, and say everything I need to say about it. Um, and so i guess it would be that i don't really put a lot of thought into like about the balance it just kind of like i i feel like it's more about the flow of everything Hmm. um but yeah i don't know i think anyone who knows me or like pays attention to anything i have to say knows how i feel about a lot of things so um i want to like be able to put some of that personal opinion into the music but also like make it a little bit more palatable so that it can reach a wider audience and maybe you know spark some thought there sure mm-hmm. sure uh something i'm curious on is is there, there there has to be some very differing influence within dying wish in terms of musicality because there are times where i feel like i'm listening to like a metallica record and then the very next moment, it's like a throwdown song. Uh, and then the very next moment, it's like the heaviest breakdown I've ever heard. 
and then followed by some very beautiful singing. Um, it's it just it's all over the board, and that's why I love Dying Wish because I never really know what I'm going to expect next. Um, mm-hmm. But then once I hear it, I'm like, oh, now I'm always going to expect that. So, um, is there a lot of different influence in the band, or is everyone kind of listening to the same stuff? Oh, definitely. Um, Sam, who you know writes all of the guitars and stuff he you know his favorite band is at the gates but also cannibal corpse and king diamond and stuff like that he's definitely like more of like a black metal guy jeff our drummer loves death metal um dying fetus we played a show with them last night that's like his favorite band um pedro you know he listens to like a lot of like old school like trust kill era hardcore um metalcore stuff but then he also like loves girl pop <laughs> and then <laughs> mackie you know mackie mackie's a hardcore guy he's from long island you know he he kind of likes he likes a lot of of different music and then myself personally like i love country i love pop i love r and i love hardcore i love punk music like i love metal so it's just kind of all over the place like you know songwriting wise like you wouldn't think this but like I take a lot of inspiration from like pop music for like my melodies and like my like structure and my courses and stuff like that. Like SZA is one of my biggest inspirations. I'm actually wearing a SZA shirt right now. Hell yeah. Um, (laughs) Like, and like, but also like Howard Jones obviously like is another one. So it's just kind of like a melting pot of a bunch of stuff, which is probably why we are so dynamic. See, I, I love that because a lot of bands would be like, yeah, we are all listening to something different. We're all influenced by something different, but then you never hear it in the actual song. And they all just, it, a lot of the shit just sounds the exact same. It's not the, it's not that way for Dying Wish. It's, it's, it's fresh all the time. I, I, I oh, love yeah. that about you guys. It's great. Thank you. I, I, that's awesome. Yeah. I'd also so, like to talk about, oh, go ahead, Mace. Oh, I can I was, ask about, along those lines, uh, w- with all the Dying Wish uh, members, who has the worst taste in music? Oh, Probably me. <laughs> no hesitation. You, you, whenever I get behind the wheel, everyone's like, "Oh, great! What time am I gonna play today?" Like, <laughs> you know, like, "Oh, yeah, let's listen to Olivia Rodrigo for the tenth time." You know, <laughs> so for sure. You know, you know th- that is kind of interesting because some of the best. Uh, uh, heavy music artists that Mason and I love, they almost never listen to heavy music, especially, especially while they're traveling. Um, the ones that Mason and I are not a huge fan of, that's all they're listening to. It's kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, especially like there's one thing that I hate so much and it's let's go to a metal show and the house music is metal Yeah. in between the bands playing. (laughs) Like, no, Give Throw me some Backstreet some Boys. John Mayer. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> let's <laughs> let's mix it up. Let's put on some pop music. Hell yeah. I'm down for that. I mean, we just saw Cal's Dow Boys, Cullen and I did, just saw Cal's Dow Boys at Furnace Fest, and they came out, and maybe they're doing this on their whole tour, but they came out to the Every Time I Touch song or whatever. And I'm like, every time that's exactly, time like, probably what they listen to in the band. For sure. Huh? Like, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. And I love that about them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. On our way, on our way to the venue today, we were listening to Neo, Sean Kingston, Justin Timberlake, um, you know, just like early two thousands bangers. I did put that on, so maybe I don't have the worst taste of music. But no, you don't. <laughs> You're good. You're I mean, good. I will. I will say about Sean Kingston. Uh, th- this is just a funny little anecdote. But uh, Cullen and I's youth pastor. Cullen and I grew up like in the you know, church, you know, youth group world. There's a reason why we loved Devil Wars Prada. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so uh, we grew up in that world. Uh, but our youth pastor, uh, his, like it was back in the day, uh, like when even before like iPhones and everything. Uh, but our youth pastor, his ringtone just for his wife, nobody else, just for his wife was Sean Kingston's Beautiful Girls. And I'm like, how do you even know this song? Like you're for sure only listening to like audio adrenaline and newsboys. Like, how do you even know <laughs> Sean Kingston? But he, that was like, every time his wife would call him on his phone, that that's what he had playing. So, uh, every time I hear that song, I don't think about the fact that Sean Kingston was suicidal about yeah. just really hot right. women. It's the fact that my youth pastor, that was his wife's ringtone. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. That's great. I love uh, that meme that's like, it's Sean Kingston and he's doing this. And it's like, oh no, a beautiful girl. I must kill myself. 
<laughs> Seriously. I mean, who, who amongst us have, have not been there, though? I mean, I, yeah. I, I get it. I get it, Sean Fair. Kingston. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're, you're, uh, you're vegan, correct? I am, and bisexual. That's a double whammy. Wow, yeah, you are so. Portland yeah. as fuck. <laughs> True. So it true. is kind. Of, it is kind of impressive. We made it thirty minutes in, and I had to ask you. So that's 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 a good oh. thing. That's a good sign, right? Zing. You yeah. must. You must not. Be, are you a CrossFitter too? No, God, no. <laughs> I do have several pairs of Tevas, though. So. Ooh. Oh yeah. I, yeah. You might as well. You might as well. Been, that would have. Then. If you just like would have shown us your Tevas, we would have known right away. We yeah. wouldn't yep. have to told us. Yeah. Yeah, I actually don't live in Oregon anymore. I live in Nashville, Tennessee now. So okay, gotcha. you know, I have a nice little granola yeehaw vibe going on. But um, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, you can yeah. you can probably uh, really uh, uh, party crash a lot of uh, bachelorette parties over you know Nashville. I absolutely could. Yeah, it's it's a fun time. I personally, I feel like a lot of the locals hate it. Maybe it's because I've only lived there for about six months. But like. It's so fun just to like see all the girls out, like feeling so good about themselves, like all matching, wearing pink and just like, you know, terrorizing the town. <laughs> it's just, it's <laughs> awesome. It's such a girly vibe. Yeah. I also feel like Nashville starting to become like the, uh, the Portland of the East though, at the same time, you know? Yeah. It's definitely getting a little more progressive. It's still pretty rough you know um, well, there's there's so many pacific northwest transplants is what i'm saying like true I, almost everyone that we've talked to yeah and la and that's true Ever, almost everyone we talk to is like yeah i live in nashville now it's like it's like the reverse does anyone, does anyone trail, not live in moving nashville? the back it's moving the other direction yeah. now you know what's funny is one of my best friends Haley douglas shout out love her to death she's from tennessee and moved to portland and her and i um you know, we were hanging out together for about two years until I moved to Nashville and I was like, all right, your turn. And she's like, I'm never going back. So <laughs> people do go the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Here's what yep. I will say about Portland though. Uh, Portland fucking loves you all. Uh, because, uh, I, I was in Portland back in like late February sometime this year and like six months ago. And, uh, it, it was back, you know, it's sort of like late February, early March where it's like really drizzly. I guess it just always is like that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but one of the things I didn't know about Portland is the first time I ever visited Portland, but there are just so many different posters and everything on every single thing that could be, you know, you could put a poster on. Uh, it mm -hmm. doesn't matter if it's like a, a street, a uh, street post, uh, or some sort of like light or whatever. I mean, just anything that you can put a, a poster on, but there was one time I walked by and there was just like this, uh, poster and sure enough, there was a dying wish poster for a show that you guys were playing in Portland. And I was like, that's exactly what I'm expecting from Portland is y'all, uh, y'all Portland Portlanders are actually, uh, really promoting dying wish out here. I, that, that's oh, what yeah. I'd love to see. Yeah. If it was, if it was a headliner one, I put it there myself, most likely. If Hell not, yeah. I don't yeah. know who did it, but oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Do you remember the days when the bands had uh, street teams in like every town and all that stuff? Is that still is that still a thing to like a certain extent? Promoters have them. Yeah. Um, I don't think that bands really do that anymore. Um, what do we got to I mean, do to bring that back? We got to bring that back. <laughs> yeah, bring it back, and uh, while you're at it, bring Warp Tour back too. Cause Hell yeah! <laughs> I feel like the two kind of go hand in hand: street teams and Warp Tour. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. There was a, I can't remember which band it was, but they had a street team that they created on their own and it was really cool. They made it look like, like Soviet propaganda. So like when you like signed up to be on the street team, like you would get like all the promotional material, but like everything looked like, like communist propaganda. It was really, really creative, really, really smart. But I think we should That's bring sick. that back. Yeah. Band, band run it. street teams. That'd be cool. I think maybe add, maybe we do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, the reason I was asking if you were vegan is—is is, is anyone else in the band vegan? No. No. So oh, when, you, when you guys are touring, is it really hard to find a place to eat for you? Um, nah, I'm pretty used to it. Like I fend for myself, and like normally there's places that we go. Like today, we went to this amazing place in Houston called uh, Taco Tacos. Don, Don Yelena or something like that. I okay. think that's what it's called. 
and um they have like a an insane menu but then they also have like soy pastor tacos oh, and nice. that was like that's like our spot when we go to houston um and then there's like a, a cheesesteak place when we go to philly um that we vegan do and like uh, vegan cheesesteaks yes that I feels like something called. that would be really difficult because it's you know it's cheese and it's steak like that's that's yeah. the name of it so it feels like how do you really get that to be yeah, really well, good vegan there's so many like vegan options for cheese and then like seitan is like oh it's like a um it's like a the devil. gluten protein yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like a gluten protein that you can like make into like a dough that you cut like you cook it and then you like cut it into slices like like steak sure. um so yeah i don't know it's pretty easy i feel like every city i have you know uh, like a place that i go to and if we're not eating together like a lot of times they'll like go off and do their own thing and i'm like all right have fun but like i live on doordash and uber eats so <laughs> as long as i like have that you know there's always like a place that i look forward to in, a, in every city as as far as like what i'm gonna eat goes so hell yeah it's not it's not that hard and if it was I 10 years like, ago, you might be saying something different, right? Yeah. Well, I was vegan. I mean, I've been vegan for about eight years, but I stopped eating meat in high school. Oh, so wow. I've seen, I've seen veganism go through a lot of changes. Um, right. And it's so much easier now, although I feel like a lot of people are kind of abandoning the idea of veganism. And I don't think that Gen Z gives a fuck about it at all. Pardon my French, um, no, you're good. which is a little, um, you know, disheartening but also i feel like um they are what's the word i'm looking for it starts with an n um where they like they just they feel like that nothing they do matters <laughs> and they're just kind of like helpless I, which i don't i don't blame them for that at all. They're, they're apathetic Nihilist or what's it called nihilism or apathetic nihilistic yeah that yeah. so wow yeah, yeah i think you're right why do you think that they're so that that way because I, I, I teach high schoolers, uh, so I have a lot of Gen Zers in right now. And, uh, um, yeah, that is kind of the case, even in, uh, you know, hardworking blue-collar South Dakota here, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just think, I, I don't know, I think Gen Z thinks they're um, that we probably screwed them a lot. And I know that millennials, we definitely feel that way about our, like, previous generations. And so I can imagine that, you know, they're looking at the situation that we're giving them with, you know, the health of the planet and just like society in general. And they're just probably like, well, you know, <laughs> here's, all, here's what I'm dealing with, I guess. So I don't know. I just feel like they're, they're probably just like a little used to, you know, they're post they're They, they were born in a post nine 11 era, you know, things, things are definitely different. Yeah. And a post Malone era. True. <laughs> He's depressed. <laughs> I don't know. Have you heard his, uh, have you heard his most recent, uh, uh, a cover of them bones you're you're a pacific northwesterner you can you you know allison chains right i do i haven't really listened to his new record that much but the one that came out before that um with the butterfly yeah oh, i loved that album it's great. but i need to revisit his new newer stuff yeah revisit his new stuff it's great and then he just did a he just did them bones by allison chains and it's the greatest cover of an allison chain song i've ever heard everyone messes it up to, he did it well yeah I, I've got to hear that. That's awesome. Yeah, I've got. All right, I've got one more vegan question for you, Emma. Um, I live in Minneapolis, okay. and there is a very famous vegan place here called the Vegan Butcher Shop. Are you familiar with? The I vegan think butcher so. Shop? I think or the so. vegan butcher maybe uh they they were actually featured on like diner drive-ins and dives like the guy fieri uh show um nice. anyway next time you guys are in minneapolis uh I would imagine, you know, being vegan, like you're, you're expecting to pay like $15 for an item, but, uh, it's one of those kind of places. It's really, really good food. Highly recommend it. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. We're actually going to be in Minneapolis next month. What really? Wow. Oh, Mason, Mason and I will, uh, we'll make the track over and we'll, we'll come see. Yeah. You. We should plug the it. Vegan butcher. It's at the Amsterdam. Um, the Amsterdam. All right. Oh, yeah. I forgot what day it is. I don't even know, but yeah, it's sometime next month. I think it's like the middle of the month so Great. sweet hopefully awesome. it's on a weekend if it's on a weekend we'll be there for sure Both should i look real quick well we can i'm sure we can look yeah we can okay. look too um yes. oh shoot speaking of guy fieri or fieri as mason says i don't know how you're supposed to say it necessarily 
Yeah. You've had a lot of hairstyles. Yeah. It is a Saturday What's, call, what say you about potentially doing a Guy Fieri hairstyle? Oh, man. Well, How badass like would that my be? hair is short right now, but I just have a mullet. So oh, hell yeah. <laughs> it's it's not. Um, but I don't know. Frosted tips. That'd maybe one badass. day I'll put all my hair off. We'll see. And then frosted, maybe I'll tips, frosted tips. Get yourself like a flame, uh, a, a flaming bowling shirt. And you're like, you're good to go. <laughs> Wow, I actually don't have a Halloween costume. Maybe I should do that. Hell yeah. There you go. That'd be awesome. <laughs> do, you, do you guys play on Halloween? Yeah, we play um, the Headbangers Boat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, perfect. Well, that should be totally your your uh, your co- Halloween costume. <laughs> yeah. I was actually going to dress up as Jeremy, and I was going to have him dress up as me, but oh, I don't know brilliant. if we're going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cross-dressing is always the way to go, in my opinion. I, I think it'd be cute. Yeah. Yeah, it would. I mean, it would be fun, but also I think Guy Fieri would be a, a great little uh, alternative, at least. So true. Yeah. What is How it? do you make that a couple's costume? He's like a convertible or something. Yeah, totally. Nice. Or just a <laughs> or just like a big vegan cheeseburger. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Chicken what wing. is it? Why, why don't bands that play on Halloween really get into it more? I I can only think of like one or two bands that have like really done like a cool a cool costume show or something like that, you know? Um, I don't know. Other than Guar, they do it every day. (laughs) Last year we all dressed up, but we dressed up as like, we didn't do like a, like a, like a costume, like matching thing. Um, we're always on tour. So it's like kind of hard because you lose track of time and dates and stuff. Sure. Um, but I have an idea that I really want to do that. I I've been mentioning it for years and it would be so easy and so niche, but do you guys watch always sunny? Yeah, I love oh, yeah. Austin. Yeah. Okay. So do you know the Bob's party episode where they're all yes. drinking beer on the plane? Drinking beer on the plane. Yeah. I literally just want to get white t shirts and tally marks and just wear that for Halloween. <laughs> but nobody thinks it's funny. Why not? Because nobody thinks nobody else in the band thinks I'm funny. Well, they're wrong. <laughs> you need you need new band members. <laughs> yeah. I thought I mean, you guys what? were friends. Kick them out. No, we are. I'm just, I just like to give them a hard time, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I do have to ask because we did interview Jeremy a couple of years ago. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and there's probably nobody in the world that loves Jeremy more than you, maybe his mom, <laughs> but like probably nobody else. Uh, rest but I, you do have to, I'm, I'm sure you give each other shit a lot. Yeah. What is and and Jeremy's inner like our episode with him is probably one of the more beloved, more downloaded episodes that we've ever had. Yeah. So Ew. people obviously love Devil Wears Prada. They love uh, Jeremy. But what is like one thing that you would say is like the most annoying thing about him, or like the thing that you're like, people should know this about this guy that like totally you're gonna you're like you're gonna undermine their their belovedness of Jeremy, uh, if you knew this about him, what's, what's the thing that, uh, you need to, to tell the world about him? I don't think he does a single thing. That's really unlikable. Um, like I, we've been dating for over a year and he's never given me the ick once. Doesn't um, he play, doesn't he, isn't he like a big golf fan? Yeah. Oh, he's such a frat. That's like the thing. <laughs> that's what I was like, aiming for. That's there gotta be go. an ick to some degree, right? <laughs> uh, kind of, but I find it really endearing for some reason. <laughs> um, but he's like such a frat guy, like such a bro, which like, I mean, in, in my own way, I'm also a bro, just like really di- like I I'm a bro in the way where like, I love like hate breed and like violence. <laughs> he oh, likes, yeah. uh, he likes like, you know, golf and drinking and beers and, like he's like the nicest guy. We can be out anywhere, and like people will recognize him. And he's just like is always like, "Hey man, what's up? Yeah, you want to drink a beer? Cool. Yeah." It's like to like any person. Um, but that and you know the whole trucker hat thing is he has more trucker hats than I do hairstyles <laughs> and hairstyles <laughs> and pairs of pants combined. Like <laughs> so. Uh, you know, his, his sense of humor is a little bit like it's he, he's got a lot of dad jokes. Um, so but besides that, I mean, he's just he's he's almost 36 years old. You know, what are you going to do? <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. Frat bro. We love him. Like uh, it. Before we get into top five, I've got one more question for you. Uh, 
And uh, that is, uh, and I know, like, I would imagine, like, being a woman in the metal hardcore world, like, it, it's, like, a thing where it's, like, people probably ask you, like, or, you know, describe you as, like, a female-fronted band or, like, and, and there's sort of, like, a stereotype that you get because of that. And I would imagine you're, like, not fond of that at all to a certain degree. But what I will say is I have, like, very consistently seen you post pictures with fans that have, like, gone out, seen you guys, and it's, like, little girls at their, like, their first metal show or whatever. And, like, they see you on stage, and it's, like, the coolest moment of their lives. And, and you take, like, a selfie with them and those sort of things. Like, I would imagine to a certain degree, like, that part of being a woman in a metal band like must feel like this is so important and so great can you talk a little bit more through like those moments when you when you get to have those moments with with young uh young women young girls uh that are like getting their first taste of the hardcore metalcore scene and them seeing themselves in you uh what, what what's that like for you yeah um well you know it's like there's two sides of the coin because like you know, there's, there's the side where people are like, oh yeah, female fronted, like you should go on tour with, and then mention only, you know, only female fronted bands. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it's like, no, like we're trying to like, wh while I do think it would be cool to be in an environment with women and like to have us like propped up like together in that environment and play to a more predominantly, you know, crowd full of women, like, I just think that it is a little bit um, disparaging and like it's kind of insulting like, oh, you only like my band because I'm a girl or, right. you know, you'll you'll only put us in a certain category because I'm a girl when in reality, you know, like and I know like Courtney from Spearbox, for example, like that band is one of the biggest bands in heavy music right now, not just mm -hmm. because they're not just the biggest girl band in music, you know, they are just generally one of the biggest bands. So mm -hmm. there's that side of the yeah. coin. But then on the other side of the coin, you know, I know that I was inspired by other women in music. Um, I still am to this day. Um, I never thought I'd be in a position to inspire young girls and young people to, you know, want to, you know, have a dream, like doing something like what I do. Um, so like there is such like a positive connotation to women in music and like the impact that we all have with each other and um, it, it is really cool, you know, just to like, like yesterday, for example, Ryan Kirby's daughter was at the show, um, at the at the fest to like see us and like, I'd heard about her and I thought that was really cool. And then, That's you know, awesome. she came out and it was like, when I meet a young girl who likes what I'm doing, like I, I kind of fangirl because I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's so awesome that they're getting exposed to it at such a young age and like it's going to change the way that they think about this kind of music forever so um long tangent but essentially you know um i i do kind of for lack of a better word bitch and moan about some experiences that i've had on the internet i'm trying to get away from that and not be so negative about it um because it is a really special and important thing fuck the trolls even the uh, unintentional <laughs> ones right true yeah. Love it. Love it. I love it. Sweet. All right. Let's get into the top five, huh? Yeah. Top five most influential albums of Emma. Here we go. Okay. Any order I'd you want. I'd say number, the first one would probably be Rock Steady by No Doubt. Hell yeah. Um, Even though now, in my opinion, it's not their best record, that was like the first real rock album that I listened to that had women in it and so that made a huge impact on me from a really young age now to this day like that's like such like an important listen yeah um after that let's see um probably would be um songs to scream at the sun by have heart yeah. Uh, that was. I was just listening out yesterday. Yeah, that is the first hardcore record I ever listened to. Um, and oh, I got goosebumps. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that the song Boston's about his dad, who's an alcoholic and not wanting to grow up and be just like his dad. Um, and that's like the reason why he was straight edge. Um, 
that song resonated with me. I'd never heard anyone talk about an experience so similar to what I had got, what I was going through at the time as a kid. Um, and so that like really opened up my eyes to like, you know, what hardcore was about, how meaningful it was and what it could do for my life. And it's my moment, like my life changed from that moment on. Um, can I say one thing about Pat Flynn, uh, from have heart, uh, along those lines uh he has one of my favorite like concert moments ever and it wasn't a concert i was at it was just something i saw on youtube once but he uh he's a high school teacher and uh they they were playing uh it was fiddlehead so it was obviously after have heart but fiddlehead was playing a show and they end the set and you know a lot of people are like one more song kind of thing or whatever and he's like and he's like not where you know he I think he lives in LA or something like that, but yeah. he was like a ways away from where he lived. And he's like, I literally teach first period tomorrow and uh, I got to get <laughs> on this awesome. plane right now. Uh, and I just like, think that's like the most badass like moment ever I've seen in like a heavy show ever. It's so cool. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. When I was uh, 16 years old, my friends and I found Pat Flynn's school email address. Oh no. And oh, we no. would email him all the time. Um, <laughs> That is a great story. I'm not proud of that. I literally forgot about that until just now. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Pat. Anyways. <laughs> um, what else? That's awesome. Yeah. Cute. I, I'm just imagining, um, I'm just imagining fans uh, emailing, emailing me to my school email and just being like, Oh my God, this is for work. <laughs> I, <laughs> Yeah. I'm gonna get the fired. one person out there that might email you, Cullen, the one fan of yours. No, I mean like oh if I was in a, if I was in a band, is what okay. I'm saying. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay, let's see another record. Uh, it'd have to be "Control" by SZA. Um, mm. That record, to this day, still one of my favorite pieces of music ever put out. Um, I have never fangirled over anyone the way that I fangirl over her. her. She really like changed me as a music fan um, and turned me into an insufferable person. So um, <laughs> <laughs> the impact she has. Um, what else? Let's see. Um, hmm. Uh, Satisfaction is the Death of Desire by Hatebreed. Oh, that yeah just front to back one of the best hardcore records of all time if not the very best hardcore record of all time um and we actually covered betrayed by life one time uh at, when we were like a really really young band at this uh festival in calgary i think that was like one of the first covers we'd ever done um so i have one more let's kill one more one more and i don't and i don't know oh oh no Oh, this is okay. This is bad. I've never said this on a podcast before. Um, you heard it here first, people. One of my favorite bands of all time, unfortunately, is a, called a band called Brand New. Um, and I don't, obviously, like I would never see them live. Jesse Lacey sucks. Yeah. Gross person. Gross person. Yeah. However, um, Devil and God is one of the most creative and influential rock albums ever created um and that song or that that record just like really like created my youth as like a young like emotional depressed kid so yeah um you know while it's like it's painful for me to listen to those songs now um because of the kind of person that he is unfortunately um, you know, that is like a really huge nostalgic thing for me and a band that I used to really love a lot. Mm. Uh, that's, uh, that's understandable. Also, I noticed that there's no Devil Wars Prada in there. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> shall we move on, Mason? I, I will say, um, <laughs> uh, with Roots Above and Branches Below was, uh, the first CD I ever bought with my own money. Hey, there you wow. go. There you go. Which is funny so i hope i hope, I hope he's i hope he's bought a few uh a few dinners since then oh G given many. the fact that that was like you know you earn your hard-earned money and that was the first <laughs> album you bought yeah my allowance because <laughs> i was a child <laughs> that's the funny part yeah that's good yeah exactly <laughs> 
Love That's it. awesome. Uh, yeah, uh, Emma, what do you want to plug? Obviously, new album's coming out soon, uh, actually a few days away from uh, when we're recording right now. Uh, tours up to the glory. My goodness, like you guys are essentially going to be on the road for the next seemingly six months. Uh, yeah, <laughs> what, what all do you want to plug? All right, well, um, I'll start with our record, Symptoms of Survival. comes out November 3rd on Sharp Tone Records. Um, 11 songs of our proudest work, so check it out. Um, we start a tour that day with our friends in Roman Candle, Foreign Hands, and Boundaries, hitting cities all across the U.S. Um, from November 3rd to December 2nd, so come check us out on um, one of those dates. After that, um, we're going to Australia in January with the Acacia Strain. Then we're hitting Europe and the UK with August Burns Red in March. Damn. And then who knows, maybe we'll announce a uh, US tour after that with some other cool bands. So the grind uh, we'll never be on stops. the road a lot next year. So yeah, come check us out. You are That's going weird. to get to know some different vegan restaurants all across the world. <laughs> yes, I am. I can't wait for Australia, especially. They have some of the best vegan food. Mm. That sounds good. good. I mean, yeah. well, hopefully, hopefully you survive all the different animals out there. I mean, <laughs> you might be vegan, but there are a lot of things out there that want to eat you. Yeah, I've heard the bugs are, uh, you know what? I Bugs are not off limits for me. I will crush you. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, bugs. Death yes, to for bugs. All those bugs. Is that listening. the song you, you wrote about war? That, that it really means like it's war with bugs, right? That's what it was about. Yes. And birds. <laughs> But they I thought have those numbers real, one right? to eight, and that should scare everybody. <laughs> uh, Emma, anything else you'd like to plug? Wink, 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 wink. Um, yeah, so we're actually um, going to be, it's not announced yet, but it's going to be announced very soon. So you heard it here first. Um, we are going to be on this incredible space cruise going to the moon, and we're going to be one of the first bands what? to play on the moon with Metallica and Lamb of God. And Elon Musk will be there. Um, Is I heard Jeff him and Bezos going to be there back too? Together, so maybe she'll do a uh, secret set. So um, yeah, we'll we'll be on the moon next year. Oh my gosh! Wow. Will Will Pink Floyd be on the other side of the moon that you guys are playing on? The dark They're side. On the I dark think, side. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's great, wow. man. Is Jeff Bezos coming as well? No, he's not allowed. We don't let bald people on the moon. Actually. Oh, that's right. That's Wait, right. at all. Yeah, so unfortunately, John Mackey can't come with us, but. Yikes. Interesting. Is, at least uh, <laughs> Lars Ulrich Jeff must be close. funding it, right? Like, he's got enough money to fund this trip, right? Who? Elon Musk? Je uh, no, no, Je Jeff, uh, Jeff Bezos. Yes, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's Elon Musk doing it, though. I don't know. Are they, oh. are they couples? Are they doing that whole thing? I think, uh, I think sooner or later, it's only a matter yeah. of time that they're going to, right? <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the power the power couple we we all need. Yeah, I Why just not, know that right? Jeff and uh, Zuckerberg are not friends because they were supposed to fight, right? No, that was uh, that was Elon and, and Zuckerberg. Or yeah, that yeah, Elon That's and Zuckerberg. Happen, aren't they? Yeah, they aren't friends. I heard they were duking it out with chickens. Oh, oh. like some cockfighting, like, huh? Wow, yes, is, it, exactly. is that illegal? Like, didn't Michael Vick get put <laughs> in prison? If you're a billionaire, for... there is nothing illegal. Wow, exactly, they can get away with anything. They can literally oh. murder someone in the street, and no one would say anything, or people would say something, but they would never get in trouble for it. So you true. know, wh while you're on the moon, you know, because there's no wind, it would be actually a great place to record. It would be really great to get some like professional recording out there when you guys play, and have you know, not only play the first show on the moon, but also get the first like professional recorded uh, music on the moon as well. It might be yeah, hard maybe. to record it though, because there's not really much, you know, air for sound to travel through. Oh, that's so true. I don't know if it would work all that well necessarily. Everyone wears headphones. That's, yeah. that's how it's going to work. Oh, it's like yeah. a silent disco or whatever they call that. Exactly. Yeah. Silent disco. What? You You've never been on one of those. It's Are you like from 1974? <laughs> no, you wear you, you these headphones and you like dance with each other while you're wearing these headphones. So it's like it's completely like, silent. I think it's like a silent that. rave. I don't think it's called a silent disco. There's no one out there doing called. staying alive or some shit. <laughs> I think there's both. There's both. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Wow. See, see, Colin, I'm not just talking out of my ass. Well, the <laughs> silent disco is for Sheila and Corey, and uh, the silent rave is for us millennials. So. That's right. 
Great. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, uh, we look forward to not just seeing you all across uh, America, but on the moon as well soon. Uh, and we certainly are looking forward to the new album, Emma, uh, where it, it like, Honestly, it's de it's definitely going to be an album of the, of the year candidate for Colin Same. and I for sure. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we're, one of us is going to have to like fight for it uh, when we do our <laughs> album of the years, our uh, album of the year. Uh, so uh, anyway, it was great to chat with you uh, again. This is like an important moment uh, for Colin and I to be able to like chat with you. It's it's such a such a cool band. Uh, you, you guys have been so so like just making such great music for a few years now and uh yeah we're, we're really stoked to see you guys soon and uh really stoked for the new album soon well thank you so much guys it's been a pleasure